hot gates gamers and strategy battle gamers from around the world i am back it's been a long long time and it was going to take something very very special to bring me out of my youtube semi-retirement hiatus uh, but i have very very generously received the following box set to review just for you guys out there that's right middle earth strategy battle gaming is here it's been many of our dream for a long long period of time and the box is here the rules are here the armies are just about here and i know that the strategy battle gaming community is incredibly excited for this so uh, so a quick one this video is going to encompass everything i'm going to unbox the contents i'm going to talk through various bits and pieces uh, and i'm also going to cover everything that i see in the rules manual as well so i hope you're ready to get your paints out sit down and uh, and listen to this video because it's more about hearing what I have to say than rather than seeing what you can see on the screen. Now do remember that much of this information is already out there. There's already been some fantastic community blogs over on the Warhammer community page. I do suggest you go and check those out. And of course after Ardacon, which has been my recent uh, in incredible event for the community we had over 200 people who play strategy battle gaming from all over the world over 23 different countries all converging on Manchester for our world team championships. Um, it was absolutely brilliant we did of course have the fabulous seminar by jay claire in which he revealed a bunch of spoilers of what we could expect from the new edition so for those of you that think that this is going to be an absolute complete overhaul of the rules apart from it being a complete overhaul in the sense that all of the faqs that have been building for years and years and years have been considered and put into these rules and a lot of it from looking through it has been tightened and worded in a way which leaves less to uh, to interpretation um, the sky is not falling this is very much the game that we uh, that we know and love i actually think that the greatest amount of changes that we're going to see going into the new edition uh, is more likely to be what we see from the uh, armies of the lord of the rings book where every single profile has been looked at going forward so middle earth strategy battle gaming we have the new box set and of course it is the battle of pelinor fields a fantastic choice i might add uh, because of course this box is going to be full of row hearing uh, now of course the box contents are all out there so i'm not going to read them out but you do get an awful lot now on the tinter web there was a lot of sort of uh, i guess queries about what the price mark might be uh you know where what we were going to be likely to see now that all that information is is out there now uh i believe pre-order is later on today so make sure that if, uh, if this is what you want that you do get this pre-ordered you can pre-order it through games workshop but probably more significantly this is going to be the first uh, middle earth product that you are going to be able to buy through your uh, local gaming store so middle earth strategy battle gaming is going to be available once again through your local gaming stores so if you want to support a local gaming store that's near to you get on that uh, local gaming stores tend to give great discounts if you want to support this youtube channel and me of course you can visit the link in the video description below which takes you through to element games if you use that link and the code jam 2166 you do get extra store credit and as well as all of the other wonderfulness that element games can give you so thank you very much for that kind of support and you support this channel going forward because i do intend to make more content let's get stuck right into this box here so it's a big hefty box you get an awful lot in it now, when people did see the contents, uh, there was, you know, there was, uh, I think, a very kind of polar opposite um, uh, opinions in the sense that there were a lot of people who were like, wow, you know, if this comes in at this price point, this is fantastic, incredible value. Uh, and I agree with that. You know, I think that you get an awful lot in this box for, uh, for the price. Uh, but then, of course, there was the other side of, of the coin where people were maybe lamenting the fact that uh, a lot of the models in here are old sculpts. Uh, now, I'm probably more of the former opinion, I have to say, because whilst from an incredibly selfish point of view, I would love to see uh, new Rise of Rohan models as, as an example. Whilst I would love to see that, uh, I also am very aware that there are many things in the game that need to be made uh, from an unselfish point of view before uh, they start looking at profiles for which there are already models available um, so in that sense i am not fussed especially because this box is in my opinion great value so uh, of course i'm going to make my way through the plastics uh, now i'm of course mainly interested in the rohirrim so stuff like the morandans and the like you know you can do what you want with them uh, you know turn them into casualties that can go on your rohirrim bases that seems a bit fitting um, and you, you know you do get an awful lot the sprues take up 
more than half. There's a Witch King on Fell Beast in here, there's loads of rides of Rohan, there's foot models of Rohan uh, and the like. We've got a troll in there as well, absolutely loads. You guys know what all these looks like. Maybe if you're new to the game you don't, but there'll be plenty of content out there and pictures that you can see just by using Google where you can see what your uh, what those old models should look like especially some nice painted images. Uh, but the one that is probably going to be the most sought off after in this box set and, and a new plastic for our range um, is the Theoden foot and mounted. So if I just bring him up, that is the sprue for the mounted model. And there we go, that is the sprue for the unmounted model. And there are two unhelmeted heads there and there are two helmeted heads so you can choose whether you want your Theoden on foot and mounted to have a combination of helm or no helm and it does leave you with a spare couple of heads which is really 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 cool uh, I'm very much a fan of that. Great to see new plastics out uh, and what's been really interesting is seeing the reaction to these so of course you can you can see Games Workshop's very own paint jobs on these miniatures um, and again um, like I guess anything which means an awful lot to some people you know strategy battle gaming as a hobby means an awful lot to an awful lot of people uh, and as such you know you again you get those differing opinions about what people think about the models now I have to say from my own point of view I think that the mounted Theoden is absolutely incredible I really really do love the mounted model uh, and on first glances looking at the foot model, uh, I guess I was a little bit less convinced. And that's not a criticism, it's because there has already been an, an amazing marker set for Theoden as a, as a model in the range, and in terms of a likeness to the actor, I think that the Theoden models have, have got to be up there with some of the greatest wargaming miniatures of all time, you know, call me biased, but that is a hard level to, to live up to, I must say. Uh, but having received the sprue and having a look over it, uh, I actually think that these faces for plastic do a damn good job. Like a really, really, really good job. So I think if you keep your paints thin and you're very, very careful, I actually think that you may achieve something which is just as good as what we see from the... Uh, from the old Theoden models. So much so that I wasn't sure, because I, I, I believe I've done a pretty good job on my Theoden, I wasn't sure whether I was going to keep the plastic Theoden, I was going to maybe you know, swap it out for something else, um, but I am almost certainly keeping this now. Um, so guys, I do recommend you go and check out some of those paint jobs. Uh, these sprues have already gone out to certain people out there who are lucky enough to have local uh, gaming stores, the great painters who in local gaming stores want these painted for their demo versions and the like. Um, so I do recommend you go and check those out. For example, Example, uh, our good friend Randy Blood over in the States. I know that he's received some and he is one of my favourite painters. Uh, so do go and check that out. So there is Theoden. And that's it for the plastics. That's as much as what I'm going to say about those. Um, I am chuffed. I'm looking forward to, to painting some, some more Rise of Rohan because <laughs> I don't have enough already. Uh, so we also get this sheet here. Uh, which has got all of your assembly guides for, your, uh, for, for everything really, for absolutely everything is on there, which is always nice. And then we come to uh, the bit which reveals that I have already cheated a little bit. We've got my cheat sheet, which is me going to be discussing about all of the rules, everything that I've noticed as I go through. We get a bag of bases, all the bases in there. We've got the big base as well for the Witch King, the flying stand. We've also got the red and green dice. Some people were speculating about whether these were going to have uh, the, you know, the, the horse of the Rohirrim on the green dice, and maybe an eye of Sauron on the red dice. These are just red and green dice. Um, but I know that those dice are coming out soon uh, and I certainly will be getting some Rohirrim ones because I'm very happy to see that the horses are on the six. What we also get here in this box uh, some of the things that you would have seen in the general sandbook, those of you that were lucky enough to pick one up before it went out. Those guys who were worried because they didn't manage to pick up a general handbook, I kind of know now why maybe um, there hasn't been any kind of rush to, to restock that because all of the scenarios that were released in the uh, General's Accessories Pack you will be able to find in a rule book and of course you do get some of the tokens as well, uh, which is great. Um, and then over here we have two books. I'll show you these first. We also do have some range rulers, which are great. This means that anybody, any of you guys out there who've never played 
strategy battle game before, it means everything that you could need to play a game is in this box, and that's the purpose of a starter box. And I'm going to throw that out there as a bit of an argument. So those of you who who are kind of like, well, why are these old miniatures, and why are we getting this? Why aren't we getting this? Why are we not getting new things along those lines? This is a starter box of a cool, iconic theme uh, that does come with some new stuff. You know, we get hardback rule book. You know, which is pretty incredible coming in the starter box. Um, but the idea is that you could get two people who've never played strategy battle game before can pick up this box and they can just play. And if that encourages new people to get into the game because it's such an iconic scene, uh, are, are there any any more iconic scenes in Lord of the Rings? I think if you were to do a vote on the most iconic scenes, I'm pretty sure that uh, the, the Battle of Pel Pelennor, particularly the Charge of the Rohirrim, comes up pretty high. Uh, and that's not just my bias speaking. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this down here. I'm going to keep my cheat sheet and also my little Hobbit rule book uh, for reference. I'm going to put this to the side and we're going to talk about the books now. Uh, so those of you that are chomping at the bit to hear all about this beautiful, shiny, great smelling Middle Earth strategy battle gaming rules manual, those of you who are chomping at the bit, uh, I'll come to that last because that's going to be the section of this video which is going to take up the greatest amount of time. So I hope you're looking forward to that. Okay, I'm going to start off with this here. So this is The Lord of the Rings, The Battle of the Pelennor Field, Scenarios and Profiles. I'm going to talk about that uh, a little bit. Uh, so in this book, not only does it give you a, a nice welcome into Middle Earth and strategy battle gaming, which of course is going to be great for those new people, um, it also describes what to do with tokens and markers and what the measurers are for and all of that kind of simple stuff um, we do have four scenarios here now when people saw the contents of uh, the box set the battle of the pelennor fields uh, some people were a little bit concerned about uh, war bands and, and how things comply with war, war bands uh, and it very kind of quickly became apparent due to a couple of comments from J. Claire Adam Troke, of course active members of the community as well as being uh, in charge of the Middle Earth team and the writing for the Middle Earth team uh, it became pretty clear that you know the box is designed with the scenario play in mind, um, and we'll come on to some some uh, different elements of that. Uh, one of the concerns were things along the lines of uh, you know would the warriors of Rohan were they uh, were they dismounts for the Rohirrim uh, in the box or uh, you know were they not dismounts? Was it that you know you'd have to do would you have to mark with tokens uh, the riders and the like? And a couple of other queries along those lines. Well, I'm pleased to say um, that from a quick glance at the at the scenarios that they put in, and there are four scenarios. We've got, oh, excuse me, we've got the charge of the Rohirrim, which is 12 rides of Rohan, uh, eight with no additional equipment, four with throwing spear versus 24 Moranans, all with the different gear, and it's exactly how they're modelled. Uh, so as you can see there. You know, there's no no issues. Some really really cool special rules in here as well. My favourite one, which I don't think. Uh, makes it into uh, the rest of the, you know the army book and the army rules for for strategy battle game, uh, but the charge of the Rohirrim is a devastating force. There are few who can hope to stand against it. These are words I like. Uh, good models that are mounted always count as charging. Even in a turn, they are charged first. This means that they will still get the extra attack and not to the ground bonus. I mean, that is cool. That would be way strong if that was in the real game. That would be awesome. I'll keep an eye out for it, but I don't imagine it will be there. Uh, but there you go. That gives you a little bit of an idea of what, what we've got there. Theoden's Last Stand. Uh, now, another one of the queries and when people were looking at it, or, or observations, is that the Witch King doesn't come with a dismount model, and that's of course there is no plastic Witch King on foot, not one that I'm aware of. Um, and actually in Theoden's Last Stand, it, it, it kind of you know, highlights why, at least at this point, you don't necessarily need one uh, in there, because to, to win Theoden's Last Stand, uh, the good player must bring down the Fell Beast, must kill the Fell Beast, uh, and that's it, then the game then the game ends, as it were. Uh, and that one looks really cool, and again, there's no need for sort of, uh, the Warriors of Rohan, it's all mounted Rohan, uh, which is how Rohan should be, right? Um, then of course we've got the we've got the March of the Dead, so that's bringing in some of the army of the dead miniatures that are in there, uh, and then you've got the final one, which is Battle of the Pelennor Fields. Now, if you uh, are, because in this one you can start to use uh, more rules from the game. Each scenario that you play allows you to introduce new rules to the game, so you can get used to it. So this is absolutely fantastic for a newbie. Um, as a bit of an example uh, of. With the Witch King doesn't have that dismount, so you might want to find a way of proxying that in. A good way of doing that, if you're a new person, is maybe you know paint up one of the Riders of the Dead black, uh, not Riders of the Dead 
worries of the dead. Maybe paint them up black, dry brush him grey instead, and that can be your dismount. Or just proxy for now. You know, this is scenario play. It's not match play, which we'll be coming on to later on. Uh, even more excitingly, we do get a little bit of a glimpse of some of the profiles. So one of the big questions out there was Theoden's change profile. And this did go up onto uh, Articon. So we did see, of course, that Theoden, uh, very similar profile from before in, the, uh, in this book. They do kind of stick to kind of a generic, there's no points, so you're not like paying points to add kit on. So it is Theoden uh, with his heavy armor, with his shield. He's armed with Herogrim um, and he gets his armored horse. So all of that comes with him. Uh, the key thing that's changed in his profile line uh, is that he now has three will. And that's a big, big, big deal for Theoden, which is very, very, very cool. Um, he has Herogrim. Herogrim is active. We'll come to that at another point. Herogrim is a sword. Uh, additionally, Theoden may use the faint special strike even if his fight value is lower than his opponent's. Now that is pretty cool. And again, we'll come to the special strikes when we talk about the rulebook itself. It also declares what heroic actions he can take. He can do heroic march, heroic strike, and heroic challenge. Now when we come to the main rulebook, all uh, heroes that have might do have access to the, I guess, the, the, standard, the, the standard heroic actions. Uh, which are heroic move, which are heroic shoot, and heroic combat. Basically, the heroics which allow you to interrupt and change um, the order in which you or your opponent do various things through through the game. Whether it's changing the order of the moving, changing the order of the shooting, or changing the order and the effects of the, of the combat phase and the fight phase. Um, now, Theoden also has. Uh, expert rider of course and he also has a new special rule the horse lord which will come on to uh, or horse lord that comes into play in the rule book and we'll talk about that that's a very very cool one so stay tuned theoden also has another special rule and this is one that i think everybody agrees that he should have such is the rousing speech given by the king of rohan that his riders will charge into the face of death for him theoden standfast is 12 rather than six makes absolute sen sense that's fourth and fear no darkness so a very very cool special rule for him there uh, now I believe that there are more special rules for him in the uh, when it comes to the armies of the Lord of the Rings. So lots to look forward to. Uh, but Theoden's real strength actually comes with what he does for the mounted models um, or, or particular profiles of mounted models to encourage you to take things uh, such as the Rider of Rohan here. Uh, because the Rider of Rohan, uh, I'm not going to go through every single profile that's in here, but they have a rule called Arise, Riders of Theoden. The speech delivered by their king has inspired a great sense of belief within the Aelingus, one which will see them put all of their they're all into the fight ahead. If this model is within 12 of Theoden, so I love that because tactically, you know, you're creating auras on the battlefield, um, which is a nice touch. Um, if a model that is within 12 and has the cavalry keyword, so we'll come on to keywords later on, then a model with this special rule receives a plus one bonus to their fight value in a turn at which they charge. That is awesome. That is absolutely awesome. And that is so good that Mr. Rohan, Clark of the Riddermark here, would almost certainly be taking Theoden um, when I'm taking a uh, Rohirrim army that is made up of Rides of Rohan uh, and assuming that it maybe covers one of the, uh, I doubt it will cover things like Sons of El, but let's just say that it covers Royal Guard because you would imagine that it would, um, then that's amazing because all of a sudden you know, you've know got Fight 5, Royal Guard charging in, um, if the army bonus is the same as what it was at Throne of Schools, that's plus one strength. So all of a sudden you've got strength four, fight five, charging Royal Guard. I think that's pretty good. Um, and assuming that it works in combination with things like Westfold Red Shields, you can have fight five rides of Rohan theoretically that are strength four uh, on the charge. And it, it's going to encourage a bit more of an aggressive play style with Rohan, which is the intent. Uh, so well done in that respect. I'm very, very, very excited for that. Uh, so that's a little bit of an idea there uh, of some of the profiles and the profile book. There's a handy little cheat sheet here at the back uh, covering all the different phases and the like. Uh, and 20 minutes into our unboxing video, we get to my uh, review and breakdown of the rules. Uh, now, I want to use this point that there are plenty of other YouTubers that have been lucky enough uh, to be sent and to review these items from around the world. So, well done to those guys. You've earned it um, as, as being stalwarts of the community and encouraging the games, not just in your areas and your countries, but also internationally and around the world. So, I do recommend you go and check out their videos. What I might do is put a comprehensive list 
list in the description below of all the different uh, YouTubers out there who that have also done a, a review video because I'm sure that they'll pick up on things. For example, uh, as you know, I am also a co-host, although it's been a long time since I've done any content, over on the GBH Help podcast and I believe that Damien is going to be doing the unboxing over there, releasing about the same time as this. So go and check that out because it's always great to hear different people's opinions uh, on this wonderfully complex uh, rich game and setting okay so middle earth strategy battle game the cheat sheet is going to come into hand uh, and let's go down so i'm going to start off with the introduction i'm not going to be showing you pages of this but we're going to go in and i'm going to go through the changes that that i can see that i think are important okay so of course when we start off with the introduction it goes through things like playing the game it does mention uh, the different ways of playing the game so you've got narrative play which is of course going to be scenarios and playing through scenarios and campaigns and the like you have also got open play which is effectively do it do whatever you want do what the hell you want you know if you've got miniatures you can pick up and play them and as long as you're aware that it is that's what it is you can go and do it and games workshop have very much been structured in this into all of their games so it's nice to see that kind of consistency and that their system systems generally are getting a bit of an identity or their, or their main systems are getting an identity such as things like keywords which I think is uh, really really good by the way uh, and then also match play has been mentioned there as well uh, and we'll come on to that later on because they've got their, their whole section uh, but I pretty much covered what they do for the most part uh, now one of the key parts here um, is actually when you get to characteristics um, so you've got characteristics there. That is a big, big, big section because when you look at characteristics and we go past that and the rules, there are things like you can never, you know, you can never go below uh, a stat of one. You can never go more than ten and the like. All of the characteristics have been described in this bit here, uh, which is really cool. Uh, the other thing, as we get to anatomy of a profile, is we get a little bit of a teaser of. Elrond and as we know that a lot of profiles have been merged together so where there is a character who has got multiple profiles and they deem it's a bit unnecessary they brought those together I still believe that there are going to be profiles of the same character that are different um, but Elrond for what I know is is not going to be one of them he's been one that's been been talked about quite a lot um, so you can see here he Elrond Master Rivendell, he's got the keywords underneath his name, Elf, Rivendell, Infantry, Hero, and Hero of Legend. Hero of Legend relates to heroic tears, and we'll come to that later on. That's basically just how good your hero is, what they can, how many troops they can lead into battle, and it also determines who has to be the leader of your force, the general of your force, and the like. Uh, now he's muted here at being 170 points, which is pretty cool, um, with heavy armor and horse options, 10 points a piece. So a maxed out Elrond, 190 points. It's a lot of points, so let's see what awesome stuff that he does. Well, he's fight six, strength four, defense Defense 5 base, um, but can obviously go up to uh, Defense 6 with his heavy armor. Um, he also he has 3 attacks, 3 wounds as you'd expect, Courage 7 as you'd expect, and all the 3's in all the right places with his might, will, and fate. Uh, but his war gear, he's got an Elven Maid, Hand and a Half Sword. Okay, so Elven Maid is going to be something um, which comes up later on in the rule book, as is Hand and a Half Sword. Uh, so this is really interesting, and it kind of takes over, for the most part, uh, you know, the special rule that Elven Blades had before, and I think that's going to be opened up to a bunch of other stuff, um, using that as a bit of an inference. Um, because he's got Vilya, um, he can obviously re-roll his dice when using Fate Points, nothing's changed there. And he's got, along with the three basic ones, he can also do Heroic Resolve, which we'll come to when we discuss Heroics, Heroic Channeling, Heroic Strike, and Heroic Defense. All, you know, a lot of those are new Heroics. We know what Heroic Channeling is, we know what Heroic Strike is, uh, but Heroic Resolve, Heroic Defense, something different in a new edition of the game, which is really cool. Special Rules, he's got Terran Woodland Creature, and then they brought in the Foresight of the Elder, which of course is in that profile in the Free Peoples um, with uh, pyjamas El Elrond. It's very expensive, um, but effectively before the game's being roll a d6 and make a note of the result. These are Elrond's foresight po points. During the priority phase, after the dice have been rolled, he may choose to expend these to alter the controlling player's dice roll. So it gives you a bit of an advantage with priority. Now I can see this working really, really well if you take uh, almost like an Elrond's household list. So you can use that to uh, buff 
uh, buffer Rivendell Nightless because of course Cavalry is so dependent on her move offs winning and losing priority so that could be really 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 cool he's also got an active special rule called Lord of the West which we can see later on and he's got the Wrath of the Bruin and uh, magical powers and renew so you can see what they've done is they've just merged all of that together and it's a real taster of what we've got to uh, got to see when we see armies of the Lord of the Rings book which I cannot wait for I'm super excited about um, so we get to the section with the rules which is key uh, and there are some basic principles in here there are basic principles in the current Hobbit strategy battle game um, but there are a few things which are determined in here which are a little bit different um, so for example uh, natural roles so nat the, the natural role has been defined in here it's been defined into the game so uh, certain special rules will state that they require the role of a natural whatever that result is so you have to get it as a natural role it can't be that you get it when it's modified and it's really good that that is defined in the terms of the game because that's one of those things that comes up in loads of games not just uh, not just games workshop games um, other things which have been uh, determined in here are of course keywords um, so some rules will contain words or phases in bold and they refer to keywords and of course uh, those special rules mm, will only affect those models um, you know which have the correlating keyword and again this is really good it's a very clean system and I'm a big big fan of introducing that into Middle Earth I can really see how it works uh, now Middle Earth kind of had keywords anyway but they weren't they weren't used as extensively so you know you did have things like man cavalry all that kind of stuff but now you do have like it, it says infantry and you can start to get a little bit more clean I suppose um, because it, it becomes a basic principle of the game uh, also, uh, there's a bunch on here about models and bases, and then directly away is defined as a term. So when something is, um, is, is told that it has to move directly away. Now the example it gives is Siege Engines, not a lot of us play with Siege Engines, um, but I imagine, um, having uh, seen Hurl, that uh, it's going to be important for things like that. So when it says to move the model directly away, there is a definition for how to do that, which is you draw an imaginary line from the centre of the, uh, of the, one of the model's bases through the centre of the other and that is directly away. So it's really cool that that has been defined. Um, so when it comes to priority, um, again, you know, there's a little bit in there where they're mentioning about um, open match and narrative um, play because in narrative play priority always goes to the good player on the first turn unless the scenario specifically states otherwise um, in, and in match and open plays it's as normal you roll as normal for priority so just a little nod there um, to the three clearly defined different ways of playing strategy battle game we've also got a move phase as well and on the whole the move phase uh, is is as we know it now i would like to point out as i'm going through this a lot of the rules here are the rules for, or were the rules for Hobbit strategy battle game previously. Uh, however, the wording on the whole has been tightened up across the board and brought in line with the FAQs, the extensive F FAQs that we've seen over a number of years. So what I'm not going to do in this is go through and talk through each, uh, each little bit of change of wording um, or where the FAQ have been, have been brought in, where the rules have already been part of the game. But I am going to say I have noticed it. There is a huge amount of the FAQs which have moved into this. What I'm going to try and do in this video is just pick out the bits which are completely different, not just the old rule book, but the rule book plus the FAQs that we've seen afterwards. I'm doing my best to do that anyway. Um, now, uh, of course, when it comes to the movement phase, one of the big things which is different is with prone models and, you know, us putting tokens next to them now, that's a big deal. And there's been a lot of things clarified in this about pro models, so I do recommend that you give that uh, a really, really, really good read. Uh, and then there's also a section about reinforcements. Now, I really like this because this does come up, and it even came up at Articon 2018 uh, this past weekend. Um, where there are scenarios which you have to move onto the board and sometimes players can uh, do things which make it very very difficult for their opponents to come on and the question comes up well what happens to that warband does it just die or does it come on the next you know the next point that it's able to and that's kind of defined in this reinforcements part so for example you play maelstrom your opponent gets to choose where you come on and they put you on somewhere where your whole warband can't fit behind them you know it's very much in the air like what do you do what do you do and it's been defined here, which is good. Which is, in match play games, whole war bands will move onto the board from the same point, right, like the reinforcements rule. The player choices where the reinforcements 
enter and must choose a place where his entire warband may be fully deployed. So the choosing player can't choose to go somewhere else. But if there's physically no way for this to be accomplished, the reinforcements may enter uh, on the next turn instead, where they gain plus one bonus to their rule. So it's good that that has been, uh, that has been rammed in there, which is really, really great. Uh, we move on to the shooting phase. Uh, it's really nice that there's a bit of a, almost like a timing chart, a bit of a guideline. You can see this throughout the book as well, of the order in which you should do things. That's not something that's necessarily existed in SPG rules before, not something that I've noticed, whereas it's, it's a bit more prevalent here. And that's really important in terms of determining when certain special rules happen or when you should be doing things. Uh, and they've done that with the shooting here. Uh, but the biggest change that I've noticed when looking through uh, the actual shooting system um, is actually talking about um, shooting at large miniatures. So for those of you that are on the Great British Hobby League Facebook page, and I do recommend everybody go there, it's not just for Brits who play Lord of the Rings, it is the largest Facebook group for strategy battle game. I can remember when there was only like 10 of us on the page or whatever, and now there's over 5,000. I can remember a huge mega thread about uh, how to do in the ways to the likes of, of Smaug, um, or whatever you do do in the ways. So you'd have like a big Smaug there, and then you've got like uh, the model shooting there, and he has a clear shot sort of straight in a straight line towards him, but then there'd be like a couple of, there'd be a few models over here that would be in the way. And the idea was like, well, do you roll for in the ways? And who is the in the ways for? And there's this huge mega thread. And the good thing in here is that this has been cleared up, you know, so there's no more confusion about things like that. And it's one of the advantages, again, about having a Middle Earth team who are members of the community. We must remember this, that they are our friends. They're people that, you know, we played these games with before they got the job roles that they did. So they're aware of a lot of the issues and they're friends with people that are very aware of all of the issues. Um, you know, this is not um, a group of people that are working away from the community, it's a group of people that's working with the community. So it's really good to see something like that, which, you know, was such a conundrum for so many people to actually be sorted out in the rule book and this rule book really does have a clean a very clean very tight feel for a, a games workshop rule book or certainly for one that i have read um or seen uh, i'm sure that questions will come up about various things i'm sure that there will be the odd mistake because it's the nature of complex rules but it's nice to kind of get a feel and notice that i really like that um so shooting largely the same uh then we go on to uh Courage. Now, courage again is mostly the same, but I did notice um, that uh, I did notice a couple of things. So, first of all, uh, when determining breaking, uh, the whole wog thing um, has all been taken care of, uh, which it needed to be. I believe that that was in an FAQ anyway. Um, so, it is one of those things that's been brought in, but it's something that I really noticed in here, and it's good to see. Um, but also one thing that I saw which is vastly different uh, and I really 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 like this now uh, as a tournament player I would sometimes try and find an advantage in taking an odd number of models into a uh, I guess what would be called a matched play situation and one of the reasons for that is that let's say that you took 21 models uh, then your break point would be half that rounded up so your break point would be 10.5 rounded up to 11 which means that to exceed the break point to break you they would have to kill 12 and you could get this like artificial advantage by having an, a, an odd number because that would be the same as um, you know somebody on an even number um, who had who had less models um, as a good or I'm sorry who had more models so uh, that has been taken away there's no rounding up of your break point now if you take 21 then your break point is 10.5 it's not 11 so therefore to exceed 10.5 is 11. 11 dead equals you're broken, not 12. And that's a very, very, very subtle, but nice, it's a nice change. It's a really nice change. It makes it clean across the board. It means that it's the same, um, the same principles of breaking, whether you're an odd or an even number. Just a, a little thing that I noticed that I, I really, really, really like. So well done, well done. I like that one. Um, then we actually go on to um, the cavalry section. Cavalry, love cavalry. Uh, again, a bunch of things cleared up in there that have been questions for all time. Um, I am, of course, just looking for the uh, for the for the big changes here. Uh, and when it looks at when we're looking at the kind of the big clearing up, I suppose uh, there's a lot in here about dismounting and making sure that you you know when you are dismounting you're in base contact. Um, you know that kind of thing. A lot of it's been been kind of very sort of tightened and cleared up. Um, 
particularly in terms of dismounting and going doing things or dismounting and making sure that you are in base contact. So what you actually do is you put the 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 dismount in base contact with the mounted model and then you pick it up and then you continue from there with anything that you need to do uh, so just a lot of clearing up again this is something that you're going to see throughout the, the sky isn't falling this is not a completely different game it is the same game but tighter um, you know things seem to be more streamlined seem to be worded better on the whole uh, but with some really cool little changes which means it's different enough to be an exciting new edition of the game um, so speaking of exciting new things, we get to one of the biggies, and a lot of you will be aware of these. This is when we get to the hero section right here. And in the hero section, um, of course, we've got like the, the, the standard what can you use might for, and like all of that's on there, modifying dice rolls, uh, but it's the heroic actions. And it's something which I spoke about before. You have those three core heroic actions, which are the ones which interrupt the timing at which you do things, either in the move phase, the shoot phase, or in the combat phase, with an added bonus in the combat phase, albeit. Um, but then, of course, we have some different ones. Now, these ones, these heroic actions, are going to be specific to various profiles. So not everybody's going to be able to heroic strike like it could before. Not everyone's going to be able to heroic march. Um, so what we're going to see is with heroes with quite specialised roles on the battlefield. And that's really cool, because it means that there's a greater degree of sort of... Um, tactical thinking when it even comes to building your army in the first place like what am I trying to get this army to do what do I want this hero's role to be on the battlefield like how do I want his might to be spent uh, which I think is great I mean heroic move I think is still heroic move and then potentially heroic combat are still probably the most important the most important ones on the whole in the game because you know being able to um, do things when you want to do them is just so so important in this game um, but it is really cool to see all of these other ones um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is Heroic Resolve Heroic Resolve is really cool uh, so Heroic Resolve I like Heroic Actions when a hero declares Heroic Resolve the effects of the Heroic Action take place immediately so that's really cool um, for any models that are within 6 inches of a hero model that declared a heroic resolve, including the hero itself, received one free additional dice to any resist test. Now this is why it's important that it happens immediately, uh, and that's because otherwise you'd be relying on a heroic move to stop somebody uh, from being able to cast, and this is an anti-casting spell. You receive one free additional dice to any resist, so it's like a mini uh, fortify spirit, which is great. Uh, and what I found throughout the kind of new rules, there are a lot of new ways to counter magic and make magic much tougher. So you can't rely on magic as much uh, as much as you used to, and that's got to be a good thing because I think that magic could very much shut down um, a lot of the cool stuff in the previous editions of Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. And of course, uh, if if I was the rules writer for the game, you want to encourage uh, your Aragorns and your Boromirs and your Bayorns and all these cool profiles. And I think magic very much kind of discouraged you from doing that so the fact that there are more ways of doing this heroic resolve being one of them is absolutely fantastic there is a little bit of a mistake here uh, where the brackets appear to be early um, so it says uh, note in the case of warrior models and hero models with no will points remaining this allows them to make a resist test on one dice rather than none at that point there should be a full stop and then it should say if a model that has the resistant magic special rule is subject to heroic resolve, they may roll two dice for their test, and then in brackets, one for heroic resolve and one for resistance to magic. The bracketed bit is actually after the first sentence. That's a little bit of a mistake there, but these things happen. It's a bit complex book. Um, I know we all know what that means. Okay, a hero who declares a heroic resolve cannot move in the same turn. Now that's now that really is interesting. So you use the heroic resolve when when really you know that sure you could do the right move but you know that you are going to get targeted by by magic regardless and it's to protect solely you know against that um, because you can't then move so it's not about being offensive it's a very 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 defensive spell um, so yeah, I think that that's really cool. It could be that they've declared a heroic move and you're looking at it and you're like, well, you know, I've got a 50-50 roll-off or whether this is... I've got a 50-50 roll-off to protect myself or I can just guarantee that the thing that they want to do with that spell is going to be much harder for them to do because they're calling a heroic move purely to cast that spell. So I think that that's very, 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 very cool. Um, 
However, they may still be able to do anything else they'd normally be able to do, such as cast magic powers. I think that's really cool. Uh, you've got Heroic March, which seems to be exactly the same. Um, Heroic Channeling, which, of course, you can use the channeled versions. When we get to magic, you'll see that there are an extensive list of new magical spells and things that are different there. Um, Heroic Accuracy is pretty much the same. Heroic Strike is the same, is exactly the same. Um, and also they've cleared up some of the interactions with things like bat swarms and the like. Uh, but then we've got another, another new one here, Heroic Defense. So uh, a hero model that declares Heroic Defense will only suffer a wound on the roll of a natural 6 in the ensuing fight phase, regardless of any mod modifiers or brutal power attacks. If the hero would normally have been wounded on the 6x4, they will only be wounded if both, the both are natural rolls. Note that the hero's model's mount is not affected by Heroic Defense. Now, if you are in a sicky situation, you're, you, you are very unlikely to win the fight because, I don't know, let's say you've got two or three dice, you're completely surrounded, you're thinking, ah, this is going to be really, really tough, maybe they need fives, maybe they've got things which give them modifiers, they're heroic, um, sorry, they're piercing striking, or whatever it else might be. Maybe... Maybe a Rider Rohan, maybe Rider Rohan charging, they're getting the plus one strength and the like, it's making it much easier to wound them. This could be that kind of, that real kind of last, right, I am not going to die, you are going to need to roll natural sixes. There are heroes in the fight and they're thinking, well, I'm going to be fine, I've got double strikes, um, you know, I need, I need fives and I've got, I've got two points of might and you think, well, you know, they, they should get this number, they'll be able to kill me off. You can call this heroic defense if you've got it in your profile and all of a sudden they need to roll natural sixes where, where then, you know, if it's double strikes, three attacks, they might just get one as opposed to maybe being able to cause two, three or even four wounds. So I think that that's really cool uh, in certain situations. Uh, we've also got heroic strength. A hero, models, uh, a hero model who declares they're using heroic strength adds d3 to their strength characteristic for duration of the fight phase. You can't increase a hero's strength above 10, of course. Um, note that this bonus is applied before other effects that affect a model strength, such as the wither magical power. Um, so that's really cool. So that's you know a little bit like the positives of um, piercing strike from previously. Uh, so that's a new one. Then we've got a, another new one, which is really interesting, called heroic challenge. And heroic challenge... If the hero accepts the heroic challenge, the models that part of the same combat, including supported models, may not ride, roll dice for the support uh, for the dual roll. Um, you can only do this, by the way, if you are in base contact with an enemy hero of the same heroic tier or higher. So you can't get big heroes going around and picking off little in insignificant heroes. It has to be, you know, you only challenge somebody that's going to be a challenge, right? Um, but the cool thing about it, if it's accepted, you know, they, they, it's just the two of them fight each other over and over and over again, which is very, 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 very cool. They must charge each other. Uh, other models may not charge either hero involved in a heroic challenge. I can see loads of situations where this could be incredibly useful, like really useful, not least in scenarios such as Contest of Champions. Could be really, you know, incredibly great. Um, whichever hero is successful in slaying their opponent will immediately gain D3 might points. Oh, that's that's huge. That's huge. Uh, if the challenge is declined, however, which you can also see situation happening, then any heroic actions called by declining the hero will not affect other friendly models until the hero who issued the challenge is slain. That is huge. That is absolutely huge. So I love this. I think that this is a really cool uh, little thing. That again, it, this is a game about heroes, and this is a very heroic cinematic thing that I'm sure we can all imagine seeing. Uh, also, uh, there are some unique heroic actions that may not be listed in here, uh, and we'll actually see that in some of the new profiles. So that's really interesting. That also gives design space going forwards for future um, future unique heroics for new profiles, which we like very, very much. Uh, so there is a little bit of a rundown of some of the new specialised heroic actions. Um, one of the massive major changes um, to Middle Earth Strategy Battle Gaming. Um, one of the other big, big changes is monsters. Monsters had become, after not being, a very, very important part of strategy battle gaming because, um, you know, they could just do so much, particularly Hurl was absolutely incredible. Um, and it really brought monsters back into the game, which was a good thing, but they were probably just a little bit too good and a bit too disruptive when they got to do what they what they wanted to do. Um, so brutal power attacks have changed. Uh, you can only do one brutal power attack per turn, so no double hurl like you see before. You know, heroic combat hurl, move somewhere else, hurl. Um, that was absolutely devastating. We're not going to see that anymore, which is great. Uh, and the main changes are to. 
uh, rend is the same, but the main changes are to hurl, which it needed to be, and also barge has changed a little bit as well. I'll mainly talk about hurl because that's going to be the most important one. Um, so it has changed, it's no longer um, d6, it's d3. Um, so it's roll the dice plus d3. Oh, sorry, roll, roll a d3 and add the difference in strength. So no longer are you going to be able to sort of hurl down a whole battle line all the time. You know, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to maybe get an extra one to three inches plus probably an extra two to four inches, depending on your thing. That's still a long way, um, but as you'll be able to see, there is an extra nuance in, in the tactics which are required to do this now. So uh, you draw an imaginary line, this is that directly away thing, again you draw an imaginary line that runs through the centre of the monster's base and the centre of the base of the model that's being hurled going directly away from the monster, this line is the direction of the hurl. This is huge, this is huge, this is exactly what we want to see, right? Uh, move the nominated model to full distance in inches equal to the hurl distance in a straight line only stopping if it makes contact with a tree, wall, a similar obstacle or model with strength 6. At the end of the move it's place prone. Okay, so same thing in those instances. So you can see situations where actually there's going to be a lot more finesse to trying to position your monster in a way. Now there was a little bit of that before but you still had a nice bit of scope with that almost 180 degrees kind of throwing arc that you could do for a miniature. And that was very, very, very powerful. Now what's very interesting here, um, so they all still suffer a strength 3 hit and not prone afterwards. Um, uh, they still get, uh, the hurled model still suffers an extra strength 3 hit for every model that it hits. An additional strength 6 hit when the hurled movement ends. Uh, but also, I'm sure I've seen this in here, let's have a look. If the hurled model hits another... Ah, here we go. So if the model is passed through is in combat, then every model engaged in that combat that is strength five or less is not prone and suffers one strength three here. Now it wasn't the case before. You could you could not you could use hurl to knock down a battle line. Um, you know, so for example, you've got a line of Corsair Reavers that have gone in and your Shadow Lord that's been protecting them against combat would hurl down and just make a perfect line right through the enemy battle line and there'd be no repercussions to the Corsair Reavers. They could piercing strike at will, get double strikes against uh, against the enemy on the floor. That is no longer the case, which is really, really great. It's been brought a little bit in line with uh, Sorceress Blast in that sense, but there's, that is not strength five is key, so you're no longer going to get certain tricks, I imagine, with Sorceress Blast on the Fell Beasts. Uh, so there we go, that's that one. Um, some little changes as well with, uh, with Barge. Uh, and then we go on to a massive section on War Beasts. I am not going to go into detail with this. Let us hope that Dan Entwistle, master of all war beasts, um, sees fit to kind of release a video about this. Um, but there is basically a huge double spread about the rules for war beasts, and it effectively clears up all because because they are unique. It clears up all of those questions that that, that come up about using using them, uh, because they you know there are certain interactions in the game which become a little bit weird when war beasts are on the table, and all of that's been cleared up. And again, it's another example of things that have been issues for years and years and years. Of course, various debates that just you know this is aiming to be the one rule book to rule them all and I can very much see this um, you know taking that place from what I've read so far uh, but there are others out there that have got more kind of critical minds than me and uh, maybe they'll notice uh, a bunch of holes that I haven't um, so we've got war beasts uh, then we've got war gear weapons and war gear now one of the massive changes and it's a great change uh, going into middle of strategy battle gaming is that every single profile will have its war gear listed so no longer will you have the situation in the old hobbit where everything is just assumed to have a hand weapon um, and uh, particularly in the early days of the hobbit and then also looking back at the source books from the um, lord of the rings era it didn't specify what weapons things could took so when you got special strikes emerging in hobbit era all of a sudden people were putting axes on everything because it was just so powerful so powerful um but that is now going to be that's going to be resolved so for example a warrior of rohan you know it will say in their profile axes or swords just like we saw with um there and back again um, and some of the later hobbit stuff uh, now as we go through you got single-handed weapons um, which you know have been defined uh, in here followed by hand and a half weapons this is a new thing hand and a half are being slotted in between two handed weapons um, and they kind of cover that that area where elven blades existed before again just opening up design space to to have hand and a half exist for the, or the rules for 
uh, that were for Elven Blades being able to exist for other profiles where they might be deserved. Um, so a hand and a half weapon can be either used as a single handed weapon or a two handed weapon, just like the old Elven Blades. Uh, whenever a model armed with a hand and a half weapon is old, uh, involved in a fight, the controlling player must decide at the start of the fight whether they'll be using their weapon as a single handed weapon or a two handed weapon. So it's exactly the same as before, but this is really, really cool, um, you know, and I think that we are going to see a bunch of profiles that clearly don't have Elven Blades effectively have that element of the Elven Blade special rule. Okay, uh, then of course we've got the details on two-handed, uh, which is exactly the same as before. Um, and then we move on to uh, special special weapons. Um, on to special weapons. When we look at special weapons, the wording for spears, or so spear supporting, again, is something which has thrown up a plethora of questions over years and years and years about what a spear supporting model can or can't do and what you can do to a spear supporting model. You know, this is one of the most extensively reworded sections from what I can see, uh, and rightly so, and it just clears everything up, you know, uh, it's nothing new in the sense of it's things that we've seen, uh, how we've been playing the game on the whole, um, and what we've seen in various FAQs, but it is an awful lot, so I do recommend that you go give the spear section, uh, use this video as a signpost to the sections that you definitely need to go and read that have 100% changed, and will change how, um, I guess, if someone was reading the old rule book, this this is just boom. This is everything is new. Everything is uh, this is exactly how it should be. There are no questions. There's no ambiguity. So I'm very happy with that. Um, I also noticed something in pikes. Uh, pikes. Uh, pikes have now got a penalty. Um, so. Due to the fact that a pike requires the use of two hands to use effectively, a model armed with a pike that's also equipped with a shield, bow or crossbow suffers a minus one penalty to its dual rolls. So I think a lot of people were concerned. Um, well, not necessarily concerned. A lot of people thought it was quite cool. When we saw the entries in there and back again, uh, for particularly the Iron Hills Dwarves, there were a lot of things in there where you could choose to swap out, you know, swap out this swap out a shield for a crossbow at this number of points for doing that swapping so you can couldn't get situations like we see on Isengard armies now for example where somebody might get a crossbow model and arm it with a pike so you end up with um, you know effectively a spear supporting backline that can also shoot uh, when they're stood still um, but I kind of like this change because it means anybody who's done any cool conversions over over years and years isn't going to be in a situation where those conversions, you know, where they've got to pull their models apart and do something new. It feels like there's been quite a bit of that kind of consideration going forwards, which is quite nice to see, I suppose, from a community point of view. I mean, it doesn't really affect affect me, but I can imagine somebody who maybe put an awful lot of effort into making a particular kind of conversion because the rule set was a particular way. You know, it's the same thing, and we'll come to it, it's the same thing with arming your models with axes and the like. They've not just turned around and said, well, okay, well, now you've got an entry, um, so you can only take weapons. There's a bunch of people who've, who've converted their models uh, because of the old edition of the game, uh, because they could do, and they were well within their rights. Whereas, you know, what we've actually seen is, okay, this is... Th we understand that that might have happened. We respect that. We're not going to get you to change your models. You just have to pay a little bit extra. You can still use them, um, but you're going to have to pay an extra point to have an axe on a model, on this kind of model. Uh, and I think that's really cool, and this is a good example of that. Minus one in the dual roll, I mean, that's, that's pretty <laughs> pretty huge. I'm not sure, do you, you know, would you, want the, would you want the crossbow and the pike together? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but very, 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 very interesting. Um, Elven made weapons is in here, so elven made weapons, again they changed the wording, so you kind of separated out elven blades, um, and you've got this elven made weapons category which, which does the whole 1 to 4, 3 to 6 thing, you've got more chance of winning a drawn con contest. Um, which is cool, but by saying elven made weapons, it opens things up to, there, you know, there are a bunch of weapons which are elven made that men carry. You know, so I think that's really cool for the design space uh, for the armies of the Lord of the Rings. So I'm a big, big fan of that. You've also got Master Forged weapons as well. Um, you know, it says here Elendil with a Master Forged sword. Models that you have a Master Forged weapon do not suffer the minus one penalty in a dual roll for using a two-handed weapon. That's really, 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 really cool. And I think that that's 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 there. It kind of gets past the need to put burly. On just a bunch of a bunch of models, um, 
you know, that weren't necessarily burly, I'd, you know, but clearly have two-handed weapons, like Elendil. So I really, really like that. Subtle, but super, super, super cool. Um, you know, and again, coming to special strikes, changing weapons on a model, everything I just spoke about, it's there. So, uh, you know, if you, uh, if a warrior model, an unnamed hero model, uh, has one of the following weapons model on so it then may exchange that type of weapon for another type from the same list at the cost of one point for a warrior and the cost of five points for a hero. So axe, club, dagger, flail, hammer, mace, maul, pick, staff or sword. So basically all of the weapons which are listed on the special strikes. This is great. Again, anybody who's, so for example, uh, the founder of the, the GBHL or the Great British Hobbit League um, as an entity, and what I mean by that is tournament organisers getting together and having one league uh, Mikolai, so Mick a lot of you guys know him um, he, against the rules but then you know, found out he modelled his Urkenbrand with an axe um, for Articom which wasn't allowed in the rules so he, he didn't use that, uh, but let's say he wanted to keep that now going forwards that would cost him an extra 5 points so his Urkenbrand would be a little bit more expensive so he could do it, it's not forcing him to change a model that he's already converted so a nice consideration again from the rules writer thanks Jay uh, for those people that, that have done those things. Um, let's talk about the special strikes themselves. Because um, these have changed massively. It was one of the, again, one of the most controversial things, I think, with the Hobbit releases. Um, was that the special strikes felt a little bit out of whack sometimes. There were certain ones which were incredibly powerful. Other ones that you just would never bother with. And some of which just didn't really feel right. Um, let's start off with Bash. The key thing that I, can, I notice with Bash is... Um, what they've done is they've changed the word in particular at the end uh, it actually gives you the suggestion of kind of almost how to use bash and the fact that these things aren't happening at the same time you can bash a model first try and knock it to the ground and then benefit from double strikes from everybody else uh, which is a little bit different from a couple of other things like when you if you um, strike somebody's horse and they roll a one on the not flying chart and you've still got dice, so you don't suddenly get double strikes on your next bit. So it's really kind of clarifying that, look, if you do this first, you will benefit from the, the two strikes. And that kind of makes it a bit more relevant, I think, which is good. Uh, you've got daggers and sword, and we've got a new one in here. So it's faint or stab. Okay, so very interesting. Um, so I can remember a while ago on the, uh, I think, I can't remember if we did it here on Hotgates Gaming or on the great, uh, on the GBHL podcast, probably on GBHL podcast, um, but uh, Steve, so GBHL Steve slash Top Table Wargaming Steve, who I think is also doing a video like this, he, uh, me and he uh, did a Rules We'd Like to See uh, video, a Rules We'd Like to See video. And one of the things that we said is that you know faint could easily be fixed um, by making sure that you can only faint if you are equal or higher fight value. Um, but I really like there's also been a consideration for all of those models that are low fight value that then get a, an opportunity to miss out, which is something I never even thought of. Um, so, sure, what we suggested for I think that was a, a very obvious fix for faint. Even the wording of faint was like you know you faint if you're a superior warrior and all that kind of thing. Um, it's the same benefit as before, but a model armed with a dagger or sword who has a lower fight value at the start of the fight than their opponent may opt to stab. If they do so, they may re-roll ones to wound if their side wins the dual roll. So you can still opt to do something with your lower fight value. However, due to the reckless abandon which a stabbing model tends to throw themselves at their enemy, if their side loses their dual roll, they'll suffer one strength two hit immediately after the fight has been resolved. Now, I don't think that that is a great punishment, because I think that what you were trying to avoid before was, you know, just fainting or, or special strikes happening because you, you just do you, you know it just makes sense to but it's nice that there is you know there's something in that so like on the roll of a six basically um for a lot of those kind of, let's say you you goblins you know you stuff for a strength two hit well let's say it's less than that isn't it if you stuff for a strength two hit it's a five uh, actually it's quite a big risk <laughs> uh silly me um, so, I mean, I actually really like the fact that that has been considered. It's not something I ever thought about, um, and it just shows the kind of thinking that's gone into building this uh, new edition of the game. Uh, piercing Strike has massively changed. It was definitely the most um, the most powerful of the special strikes before, uh, being able to sort of go up by D3 strength if you want. Um, but a model armed with an axe or pick piercing, can opt to the Piercing Strike. If the side wins the fight, they can increase their model strength by one when they strike. And that makes it a lot less powerful it means that there will be times where you think oh actually I'm strength 4 and they're defense 7 do you know what I'm going to go for it because 
wounding on sixes and wounding on fives is a massive difference so I'm going to give that a go uh, but you still have the uh, if you lose you could reduce by d3 so I actually really really like that change it's it's nice and straightforward and easy um, and it means that you don't have a special strike which is massively overpowered it's just useful at key moments potentially but there is a big risk uh, stun uh, stun is largely the same I believe I'll just have a quick check because I didn't write anything down for stun um, I believe that stun it could be that the being able to stun let's have a look it's here it could be that yeah so before it was on a 4 plus I thought so uh, but now it's on a 5 plus or a six plus if it's a monster. Great change. No longer do you have like, you know, a couple of hobbits, you know, hobbit sheriffs trying to stun Smaug on a four plus and then that's him dead for the rest of the game. Like, you know, they need it on a six, so you're gonna have to commit a lot of a lot of hobbits to try and stun uh, to do that. Probably still worth it to be honest. Um, but still, you know, it did it didn't feel right before that you could get something go over and, you know, with a tiny little stick and whack Smaug on the head and have a fifty fifty chance of basically putting him out of the game and you having enough hobbits to kind of almost guarantee that so a very 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 subtle change I think on a 5 plus is much much better uh, than, than a 4 plus you got 1 in 3 chance you've got to start committing more models to actually try that special strike um, if you are banking on getting it for part of your tactics uh, it's coming up to the hour mark now I hope you're all enjoying yourself grab yourself a brew break if you want um, because we are probably uh, probably got about well, I'm not even going to try and make a guess of how long we've got left in this video, uh, but I've still got a bunch of notes and we've not gone through special, um, not special strikes, we've not gone through uh, special rules and magical powers where there are some big, big, big changes and some new additions and the like. Um, so yeah, uh, we've got uh, worlds which are exactly the same. Uh, big, big change comes on the next page which is about throwing weapons, so if you're charging into combat now you do not suffer the minus one when using a throwing weapon great change. Throwing weapons totally not worth it before. Um, I will now consider taking throwing weapons um, or throwing spears with my Rohirrim because all of a sudden you've got 50% of the models hitting and you know let's say for example you take 20, uh, eight, 18 Royal Guard with throwing spears. You take 18 Royal Guard with throwing spears, they all charge in, nine of them hit, you know if they're needing sixes, you're going to hope to get one or two dead, which is you know, all of a sudden it's worth, it's worth, um, you know, worth those points if you get two. Um, but if it's fives or, or less, you know what I mean, or fours even, you know, they're absolutely worth it. So, I think the change to throwing spears, we all knew that that would that would make absolute sense, and it's good to see that. Uh, another big one is the changes to banners. Really, really like some of these changes. Um, so with banners, there's a lot to do with a banner that is prone. So no longer can a banner model that is in prone that you're in base contact with pass its banner. Um, also, models cannot benefit from the banner if the banner model is prone and lying on the floor. Makes sense. The banner's not flying, people aren't inspired, the banner model's not over. Um, so that is a really cool little subtle change. Uh, really, 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 really like that. Um, so a warrior model, they cleared up who you can pass to. A warrior model carrying the banner who is slain may pass it on to a friendly warrior model, but not hero model, who is in base contact, not prone, and not engaged in a fight. Look at that. Absolutely perfect. Perfect. Well done. Absolutely nails that up. Uh, Elven cloaks, it just refers you to a special rule, the stalk unseen, so they've cleaned that up. Uh, the war drum has been added into this, because again, this is going to be one rule book to rule them all, and that's the goal. And war horns are exactly the same as before. Okay, uh, next one is the One Ring. Uh, the rules generally look e exactly the same, um, apart from you know they have put in some of the things from the FAQ, like if you put the ring on when you're mounted, the the mount will bolt and all that kind of stuff to stop Isildur um, and Bilbo and Pony shenanigans. Um, but there is also for match play a uh, a tier of who would have the ring. Um, so if you come up against Sauron uh, and you've got Bilbo Baggins with the ring in your force. Sauron has the ring, you know, he's the top, top priority. So you've got Sauron, Isildur, Bill Baggins from Foreign's Company, or Bill Baggins, Master Bur Burglar from the Survivors of Late Town Army List. And you've also got, you've got Frodo Baggins, and then you've got Bilbo Baggins from the Shire or Rivendell Army List. A little bit of a clue to seeing some Bilbo's in some other lists there. And then Gollum. 
Okay. Now it does say in the rare situation where both players control models that have the ring, and both models are the same on the hierarchy table, both players may well use the ring. So that's really interesting. But we assume that one of them is fake, and whoever the loser is, that person had the fake ring. Very, 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 very interesting. Uh, so next up, um, we come to armor and shields and the like. Uh, and did notice something with shields. Um, so it says, ah, uh, okay, so before you had a situation again where um you know two hand two models with two handy weapons couldn't you use, use shield they couldn't have a, a shield on them um now um if a model uses a hand and half weapon as a two handed weapon whilst carrying a shield it will use the plus one bonus to their defense so we're talking about things like um let's say you've got your warriors of Rivendell and there they've got a shield and they've got an elven blade and the elven blade is an elven made an elven made hand and a half weapon because that will be what it would look like in its entry uh, all of a sudden you've got that choice to make well actually you know um, if I go I'm going to use it as a two handed weapon um, but not only do I have the risk of not losing the fight I'm also going to suffer defence but I can still have the shield in the first place so just a little a little bit of a, a little bit of tweaking there which I kind of like so we come up to a massive section now magical powers magic has been really looked at I think we all knew that this was a very 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 strong part of strategy battle gaming and one that needed a, uh, a good cast over it I mean I think one of the most important changes is there's very much that kind of um, Stormcaller-esque rule. So uh, if you roll a natural six when resisting a spell, you will keep that will point. And I think that that is great. That is such a good little change. Massive, massive, massive fan of that. Absolutely love it. Uh, again, in rules that we would like to see, and it'd be really interesting for you guys once you get the rule book, go and check out that series and just see how right or wrong we were on certain suggestions and do you think that things that we suggested were better or worse than like what I'm really glad to see is that actually a lot of it is pretty in line and that comes back to that point again that these guys who are, who are doing these rules they're part of the community they hear these conversations you know there are those debates that are had it's not something which is happening on an alien planet in isolation which is really cool um, so I like that I like that um, all the dice are rolled together, yep, 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 we like that, and if, obviously if you get the, the six, that's important. Um, we also have uh, all of the magic, every single magical power that was sort of written in a profile or anything before, everything has a channeled version now, and so it all comes into this one book to rule them all, which is what it's going to inevitably uh, be. Um, so they all have a, a channeled version of them. Um, now we get to go through these, so... Uh, let's have a look at what some of those changes are. So you've got Aura of Command. Uh, Aura of Command is the same as before. There we go. So Aura of Command, same as before. Aura of Dismay, same as before. Uh, banishment has uh, changed its wording ever so slightly. So Banishment um, has also had added if the target is a cavalry model, the caster can choose whether the rider or the mount suffers the effect. So similar to Black Dart. Um, and that's just bringing it in line with other magical powers, because magical powers target the model, not the um, not uh, any kind of individual part of that model. Um, so that's really, really cool. Um, Black Dart is in there. We've got Blade Wrath. Everybody remembers Blade Wrath. Blade Wrath has got a channeled um, a channel version now. All strikes are resolved at strength 10 instead of 6. So pretty good. Um, Blessing of the Valor. New, new one. Uh, this power targets one friendly model within range. They immediately cover, uh, recover a fate points when earlier in the battle. Uh, battle. If the target is a cavalry model, you choose. Again, so these things about choosing which part um, are all cleaned up. Uh, so that's really, really cool. Channeled version, target instead recovers D3 fate. Uh, there's a lot of risk to all of the channeled powers in here. Everything um, that, you know, there's no D3 plus one uh, like there used to be with like Sapwill and the like. That's changed. Um, uh, Blessing of the Valor is an instant spell as you'd expect it to be. Reading that word in. Um, you have got Blinding Light, which is the same. Uh, cool Winds is in here, um, which of course is the uh, Rivendell. Stormcaller person um, that I've only ever seen once and that was at a Desolation Stop Port by Mick again to mention him give him a shout out uh, Chill Soul is in here and seems the same Collapse Rocks is a new one 
This power targets one enemy model within range. The power can only be cast on a model that is within a ruined stone or brick building. So this is this is a kind of counter to, you know, if you're going and playing at an event and there's tons and tons of terrain and people are like hiding within buildings and the like, you might have decided or thought, you know, let's say you're going to Top Table Wargaming Steve's Scouring of Cheshire event, you know that there's going to be a bunch of terrain there, maybe you consider taking a caster who has Collapse Rocks um, because you know that there will be times where there are objectives hidden in funny places um, and you might need to try and, you know, cause some, some issues. Target suffers one strength five hit and the channel version is all models friend and foe within two inches also suffer one strength five hit. So that's really cool and thematic and you know, very cinematic, you know, we can kind of see that, can't we? Uh, wizard being able to do that. You have got um, command compel, and again the wording in there has been uh, has been tightened. Uh, curse is as before, and then we've also got drain courage as well. Uh, so if I miss any of these as being changed, you know, do 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 let me know in the comments below. Uh, but I believe that those ones are all the same. Uh, we move on to the next one. Uh, so you've got enchanted blades. Uh, this power targets one friendly model within range. In the fight phase, the target may re-roll all failed to wound rolls. And channel version, additionally, the target may add one to all wo to wound rolls. So that's really, really useful. Enraged Beast is in here. So again, coming in line, every single model that's had a magical power, you're not going to have to go to the entries uh, in, you know, in the army's book. Instead, you know, it'll just say what spell they've got, and you'll be able to come to your one book, one massive book here, which is really cool. Uh, Flame Burst. This is a new one. Uh, this power targets one enemy friendly model within range, the target model immediately suffers one strength six hit, and if it's channeled, the target instead suffers the effects of the set ablaze special rule. Really cool. Uh, 45 Fortify Spirit. Uh, da, 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 Fortify Spirit is the same. Uh, Fury has changed, which you know we all felt that it needed to change, which is good. They've tightened up uh, about keywords, unlike when it comes to comes to Fury. Uh, but if you cast Fury, it is pretty much um, all targets will automatically pass courage tests that they're required to make. So that's that's great. Um, no longer though does it also give you the special fate save. You have to channel to get that uh, and when, if you channel it on the, on the roll of a six rather than before it was the roll of a six but if you channeled it came down to a five. They now separated the two. You have to channel Fury to get the special fate save and it's only on a six. So instead of one in three potentially it's uh, it's just one in six models that it's saving. Great change. Great change. It, ne it needed to be divided up either into two different spells or like that and it's effectively two different spells if you're having to channel it. Um, immobilize Transfix. Pretty much the same. Um, but, but, but. Um, but what they've tidied up is about active active special rules and passive special rules. So if it's an active special rule, Transfix can shut that down. But if there are passive special rules, it won't. Uh, and all special rules are listed as being active and passive. So effectively, active and passive special rules are pretty much, on the whole, all to do with getting immobilized or transfixed, on the whole. Um, and commanded and compelled, of course. Uh, you've got Instill Fear there. Um, so this power targets all enemy models within range. Each effective model must take courage test in the order chosen by the caster. If test is failed, then the model must move its maximum move distance directly away from the caster. And that's really cool. There's a few other little bits in there. Um, and they can't move any further. That could be really powerful. Uh, if it's channeled, courage test caused by this magic power taken on a D, uh, 3d6 discarding the highest result. That's a really cool little rule. You can see how that would be, uh, be very useful. Nature's Wrath is in here. Panic Steed. Paralyze is in as well. Um, and it's got a channel version where you suffer a strength five hit. You've got protection of the valor. So this is uh, this is very very good. And again, it comes back to that point of protecting uh, protecting against magic. It's not just all about um, it's not just you know a game which is going to be heavily dominated by magic. I say that. I mean this is a magical a magical power that you need to cast. But this power may target the caster or a single friendly model within three inches. The target may not be targeted by an animal's magic, magical powers or special rules. So you know it does give the example of the Golden King or the Dead Marsh Bets as Fell Light is within them. This is a very 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 powerful spell in uh, competitive play from what we've seen so far. Competitive play might change massively. Um, and this is the kind of thing that would change that. 
Um, so it, it's going to be really interesting to see how the meta kind of develops and evolves over the coming months. I'm really excited. Protection of Valor, great spell. I wonder who might take that. I imagine, you know, you're going to be looking at, I don't know, Protection of Valor, a Tom Bombadil and a Gandalf the White kind of kind of character. Who knows? Uh, refreshing Song. Well, that sounds like a Tom Bombadil one, um, and that's in here as well. Um, in fact, that is that is pretty much his. Uh, so the target immediately recovers a single wound as well as a single lost might, will and fate. Uh, but if it's channeled, they recover all lost wounds rather than just one in addition to the other effects. Renew is in here. Sap will has changed. Sap will. This power targets one enemy model within range. The target model immediately loses D3 will points. So before it's D3 plus one. If the target is a cavalry model, the caster must choose whether the rider or mount loses, uh, loses will. Uh, in fact, sorry, it wasn't D3 plus one for Sap will. It was... Oh, it was, yeah. So D3 plus 1 before, and the channel version was lose all of your will points. Well, now it's D3, and if it's channeled, the target loses D6. Again, there's a big risk there. There's a big risk. Like, do you channel sap will? I'm not sure you do. It's too risky. Too risky. Um, I think you always just no use it normally. Shatter is in here, which wasn't before, and then there's also a new one here. Um... Oh, we channel Shatter, sorry. The target additionally suffers 1 strength 6 hit. You've got the Shroud of Shadows. For the Shroud of uh, Shadows, that's quite pretty tough one to say. After uh, maybe in the maybe on the Sunday morning of a of a Great British Hobbit League tournament somewhere, Shroud of Shadows. This power targets a friendly model within range. The target is considered to be invisible until the end phase. They cannot be targeted by enemy models' magical powers, special rules, or suiting attacks, and do not count as in the way. They have no controls on whilst invisible, and enemy models may even move through them. An enemy model may not end its movement on the space the target is taken up. If an enemy wishes to charge the target, it must pass a courage test applying a penalty of minus one to the roll for every full one inch the target is away from the foe. That's really good. Again, it protects against so much. You know, you've got a model which is, you know, uh, it's holding on to an heirloom or an artifact or whatever else, and you need to get it out of dodge, or you know that the enemy really, you know, it's it's your leader, and you need to get your leader out of there. And you've got someone who can cast on him. This is going to be a great spell. And channeled. Additionally, during the fight phase, enemy any enemy model engaged in combat with the target halves its fight value for the duration of the duel. It's the rule. <laughs> it's the rule from. The ring, of course. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's really, really, really interesting. Very, very cool. Sorcerer's Blast has changed. Sorcerer's Blast, of course, being such an important part of a uh, competitive strategy battle game over the last few years. Uh, this power targets one enemy model within range. The target is blasted D6 away from the caster and not prone. So that's the same. If target comes into contact with another model which is strength 5 or less, it will immediately stop and both models will be not prone. So no more blasting through a line. just goes into them and they both are knocked down. Uh, if the target or one of the models that is not prone is engaged in combat, then all models, friend and foe in the same fight, are also not prone. The target model suffers one strength five hit, and any other models not prone suffer one strength three hit. Cavalry models are treated as having rolled the not flying result on the thrown rider chart. So again, no longer are you going to get situations where people are blasting models down down a line. Um, you know that's. Uh, that is a big and very, very important change. Additionally, if the target comes into contact with a piece of terrain such as an obstacle like a hedge house or large rock, um, then they suffer a strength 6 hit, immediately not prone. So that's cool. Uh, both the target and obstacle model will suffer 1 strength 3 hit. No, even transfix compelled or otherwise immobilised models will be blasted by this power. Uh, when it's channeled, the initial hit is instead strength 6, and every other model, model suffers 1 strength 4 hit. So the big change there is that the model will stop will stop. Uh, you've got Strength and Will, uh, Terrifying Aura there, Tremor. Tremor's got um, a 2d6 line if it's channeled. Wither. So Wither, um, you reduce the strength for the remainder of the game by 1. Uh, and if it's channeled, it's instead by d3. Wrath of the Bruinen, um, you know, all the, targets are, the, target, the power targets all enemy models within range. All enemy models within 6 inches of the castle are not prone. Cavalry models are automatically treated to suffer the not flying result and thrown rider table. Both rider and mount and they're not prone. All effective models suffer 1 strength 2 hit or 1 strength 8 hit if they're in a, a stream with a, of a similar water terrain feature. That's very cool. Uh, if it's channeled, you suffer a strength 3 hit and then a strength 9 hit if you're in a stream. And then, of course, you've got staff is broken. That is all of the magical powers listed in here. So I imagine those are all the magical powers that we will see uh, in the armies of Lord of the Rings and the armies of the Hobbit era uh, books that are coming up. Okay, so next up we've got the special rules side, and we come back to the 
passive and active special rules um, and it actually gives you a nice description here of the difference between a passive uh, and an active special rule. So a passive special rule is one that takes effect regardless of other factors and that's the simplification of it. And it says for example a troll is still terrifying even if which is right, right? Uh, an active special rule is one that requires the, the user to, act, to, to actually act or do something. Um, and every single special rule, it tells you whether they are active or otherwise. So you've got ancient enemies, uh, which relates to keywords and the like. That is an active one. Ancient evil, though, for example, uh, with a minus one to courage, is passive. You've got backstabbers, which is active. Bane of kings, or venom, which you've now come together because they're effectively the same thing. That is an active one. Bane Weapons, so again this will relate to keywords, is an active one. Blades of the Dead, which is wounding against courage, is an active one. Blood and Glory, if this model kills an enemy model in fight, may, they may immediately regain a single point of might spent early in the battle. That is active. Bodyguard, now Bodyguard has changed significantly and it's one that we see a lot of, so it's worth talking about. All Warrior and Hero models from the same army list with this special rule will automatically Bodyguard the hero from the same army list with the highest Heroic tier. Remember, we'll come on to Heroic tier. So basically, you know, if you're in a Rohan army, Theoden is the guy who will be Bodyguarded. You ain't going to be able to choose, you know, Eowyn at the back just so that you can keep your Bodyguard rule because she's hiding away in some building somewhere. It's got to be Theoden. He's the, he's the man. He's the guy. He's the, he's the one who's who's leading the army into battle. So he's the one that, that they bodyguard. And that's absolutely right. So it's really cool little changes like that that I think everyone's going to be happy to see. Um, which, you know, which are incredibly fluffy and thematic. Um, so I really, really, really like that. Of course, if they're matching, you get to pick which one. Um, models that are part of an allied contingent must select a model from their own list. Again, that's really good. That's really good. Um... Burly is passive, you know, they're, they're burly regardless, aren't they? Um, you've got uh, Cave Dweller is active, Expert Rider, active, Expert Shot, active, Fearless is passive, uh, Fell Sight is passive, um, and Fell Sight actually specifically um, puts in the entry about Stork Unseen, so about Elven Cloaks and the like, which is nice to see. Fleetfoot, so Fleetfoot, we've seen that special rule, of course, with... Um, Galadrim Knights, uh, a model that has this special rule and the Woodland Creature special rule will also, will also apply the effects of Woodland Creature to their mount so the whole model treats the Woodland terrain as clear for the, tra for the purposes of movement. So it, it's been widely suspected that going into the new edition of the game that like uh, Rivendell Knights as an example, unless they have the Fleetfoot special rule they will suffer the moving through woods uh, penalty whilst they are mounted uh, which is huge right, whereas before they could just run through um, and all of some fleet foot on Galadrim Knights didn't seem actually that great. Uh, Fly now, Fly has got um, Fly is really interesting because you can choose you can choose to use a no your normal move value. So what you're going to see now is like uh, and I believe if I look at the back of this one here, if you look at the uh, Witch King Vanmar, you look at the Fell Beast. The Fell Beast has got a movement value of three, not twelve. Fly gives the movement of up to 12, so it's the special rule that gives that. But now they can move through on their own back, and if you do that, that means that you can move into woods. So remember, a flying model can't land in woodland terrain, um, you know, not allowed to do that. However, what a fell beast could do or an eagle could do is they could opt not to fly and they could move three inches, although it wouldn't be three inches, it'd be half, so one and a half inch into a woods if they need to get to somebody. Um, which I think is a really cool special rule and it also means that if you've got Floy still in the game uh, turning off the fly special rule they can still move you know uh, it's just that they can't fly so I like that I like that um, Harb and that's an active special rule Harbinger of Evil so it can be targeted as well uh, Harbinger of Evil is passive Hatred which again comes into keywords is active and yes Horse Lord now Horse Lord is passive and this is a really cool new one um, which is going to relate massively to the Rohirrim. Whilst this model is mounted, they may choose to expend their own fate points to prevent wounds caused to their mount. This could be huge, huge. And, you know, to quote a certain American president, huge, very, very huge. Because there are times when, you know, when you're there and you're the Rohirrim, where you know, it only works if you're able to get in that charge, that initial charge, and do what you need to do off of that charge. And you know what? A wound is caused to the mount as you're about to do that for a shot, and you know, you're know you looking at it and you're thinking, do you know what? I'm going to use a fate point here. 
it's it can be in situations very worth it not all the time you're not going to want to do that all the time but sometimes you're going to look at it and go i'd actually rather be on my horse so that i get to do what this hero should do for this turn um so i'll risk the fate point so yeah really 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 like that one you've got master of battle in there which is active mighty blow which is active you've got mighty hero which is passive Monstrous Charge, which is of course the uh, special rule relating to Monstrous Cavalry. Um, and it's got all of the things about in the way in there and the like, and how it, how charging cavalry, um, and extra attack bonus and the like. All of that is in there, that's an active one. Mountain Dweller is active, Poisoned Weapons is active. Resistant to Magic, another really important change, it's passive. If this model is targeted by a magical power, it may use an additional three dice when it makes a resist test, even if it has no will remaining or decides not to use any will points from its store. This is amazing this is exactly the change that i'd expect to see like a mini uh, fortify spirit because resistance to magic just did not do anything until you're on zero will and that was terrible <laughs> that was terrible resistance to magic wasn't useful i mean it'd be useful if you were counting on i don't know blasting or nature's rutting through hobbits and the like and one of them annoyingly resisted you on a six because that's what happens far too regularly um but the fact that this is uh, that this has made this change, this is going to be absolutely massive. Effectively, one free dice when resisting. For resi I mean, I'm going to be really interested to see who has a resistance magic special rule. Those are going to be very powerful heroes. Very powerful heroes. Um, <clears throat> set of blaze, passive. Shield Wall is in there. We remember Shield Wall, of course, from the Iron Hill Dwarves. I believe that others are going to see Shield Wall, such as Warriors and Minas Tirith. That will change the meta. Absolutely. Stork Unseen. Uh, we know that one survive that's passive. Survival instinct is active. Of course, that's the one that we see with mummocks and the like. Uh, swift movement is active. Swarm protector is active. Terror is passive. Um, throw stones is active. Unyielding combat stance is active. Will of evil is passive. Du -du 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 -du. And will of evil also clears up some of the things about popping yourself um, when you cast. So. Do you still get to resolve this spell? Yes, you do. Um, so that's really nice to see. Woodland Creature, an infantry model. We see a keyword there, being used. Being used in the book. It's relevant. An infantry model with a special rule may move through woods and forests that are classified as difficult terrains if they're open ground. Fantastic. So there we go. Uh, we've got some advanced rule stuff here as well. Uh, nothing really, really um, to talk about in there. It's pretty much the same. Uh, when it comes to the next one, which is Siege Engines, which is an area I don't know a huge amount about, the key changes seem to be uh, Siege Veterans is quite important. So... Um, it actually says Siege Veterans. Additionally, a single member of every single Siege Engine crew is always a Siege Veteran. This is big, so you're not having to pay like 50 points for like a captain or whatever now. Uh, they, ha they have a single point of might, will and fate and will replace the warrior keyword with a hero keyword. Unlike other hero models, Siege Veterans may use their might's influence hit to wound and scatter rolls for the Siege Engine. That's a really good little change. Makes, uh, makes Siege Engines useful. I think just brings them... Um, makes them a bit more viable, I suppose, without having to pay a great deal of points. Uh, so that's the one that I noticed there. Um, and also the friends in proximity in the way and deploying the siege engine all seem to have changed ever so slightly. I'm not going to go into details about that, but I will signpost the, uh, you to them so you can have a little bit of a look. Uh, so then we move on to the next section um, where there are important changes. Uh, and it starts talking about, so we've got sieges in there, again, I didn't really notice any changes massively in there, maybe they exist. Uh, narrative play, so we know narrative play, that's going to be lots of scenarios, it tells you here, in here, there's a full uh, two page spread, including you know, a title page, um, about how to play narrative play games, also one for open play, uh, and then you've got match play, and there's a bunch of things in here with match play. Um, particularly, let's have a look, look here, so... Um, it goes through points value, size of the games, what points limits it recommends. It actually uh, gives you defined titles like they do in Age of Sigma and 40k, I believe, for although it's a little bit more approximate. So they say a skirmish is around 400 points. A battle is typically between 600 and 1,000 points. So that's kind of, I suppose, where they want you to play the game. Or you can have an all-out war game, which is typically more than uh, 1,250 points, which is your all-day friends coming over doing crazy, big, massive Pelennor fields with 50 Mama Kill style games. Um, so it goes through that. Um, 
it tells you what an objective marker should be. Uh, it recommends using 25mm uh, markers, um, which is cool. It's also got army list, what does it say? Army list entries. So you've got war bands. Let's see, what does it say about. Yeah, that's not relevant. Uh, none of that's relevant. All of that's pretty much the same as before, of like what we know of how to play the game. I think in the back of the old rules manual, this was just called Battles in Middle Earth. So actually, sort of how to go out there and play the game. That was this section before. Um, but what we do have in here as well is Heroic Tears. So heroic Tears are part of match play. And this is a huge change and one which we've kind of anticipated, but it's, it's, it's in here now. So you've got Tier 1 is Heroes of Legends. Heroes of Legends may lead up to 18 followers from their warband, and additionally, if the Hero of Legend is your leader, they gain the Last Stand Special Rule. The Last Stand Special Rule is the first time a model with this special rule takes a courage test as a result of your force being broken, they'll pass the test automatically. This is massive. Um, and if you think about the type of heroes that are going to be Heroes of Legend, you know, this is going to be pretty huge for the forces that they take as well. So, you know, Aragorn obviously a hero of legend. Theoden is a hero of legend. Um, so that is massive. I really like that. So you get broken, you know, let's say on Theoden, he's got that 12 inch stand fast now, you know, he's going to ignore the effects of being broken. Your riders are guaranteed to be staying around for, for that next turn. Um, so it just really adds that extra value as well as being able to take up to 18 followers, which is going to be good for those armies where you've got, um, where, where I guess you can uh, where well you can fill up on that. I don't think it's going to affect the Rohirrim as much because it, it probably doesn't matter that Theoden can take up to 18 because you're taking less models generally anyway and you want to probably be having three heroes at minimum so you're probably going to want to spread those models out amongst the warbands but it just gives you a bit of a, a bit of a clue there. We've also got Heroes of Valor which are the tier 2. Heroes of Valor may lead up to 15 uh, followers in their warband. An example of a Hero of Valor is Tariel. It's cool. No special rules with that though. Heroes of Fortitude can lead up to 12 followers, so that's kind of the warband rules as they are now. You've got minor heroes. Uh, Eowyn is listed as a minor hero, which makes her much less viable in a Rohirrim force. Um, and she, well, it depends on what her profile is, of course, um, but minor heroes can only lead up to six followers in a warband, but they may not be the army's leader. That's very interesting. It'd be quite interesting to sort of speculate who we think are going to be minor heroes. For example, will we finally see Range of the North become minor heroes? Who knows? Who knows? Uh, and then, of course, you've got independent heroes who can't lead troops. Uh, they may, however, be included in another hero model's warband as one of their followers. That is very interesting. That's very, very interesting. So you might not want to use them as a free drop in certain situations. Interesting. Um, put in the comments below if you can see useful uh, synergies with that as a new thing. Uh, now it does specify here, the leader, um, that you'll have to indicate which one of your hero models is the leader of the army. The leader will automatically be the hero that has the, hero the highest heroic tier. Makes sense. If you're again using the example of Rohan, if you have Theoden, he should be the leader of that army. And that's how, that's how it should be. And they built that into this now, which I really, really, really like. Again, no situations there where, I don't know, I imagine in a Gondor list, or Minas Tirith list, sorry, where you maybe make Beragond your leader and you hide him somewhere whilst Boromir and Faramir go and kick bum. Um, so very, very, very nice change there. Um, your army must have a leader. If you're tired for, um, so if you've got like two heroes of valor as your highest leader, you can choose to control your player who is the leader. Uh, now, army bonuses. If your army consists entirely of models for a single army list, then the army receives its own unique bonus. Each army bonus will be listed in the introduction for each army list. So we've got that to look forward to in the Armies of the Lord of the Rings and the Armies of the Hobbits books. So I can't wait for that. Um, but also, it's only if they contain models from a single list. You can add allies, and there is now something called the, ally the Alliance Matrix. 
Um, so it does say that, of course, you can only, if you're good, you can only ally with good in match play, and if you're evil, you can only ally with evil. But what it also does is it comes up with a matrix, which is a chart, and you've got three different levels. Now, in the rule book, this is a limited alliance matrix. Not all of the army lists are on here. I can tell you that straight off, off the bat. Like, there's just not enough of them in this example one. And it even says, it even says, uh, the full allies matrix complete with all of the armies present within Middle Earth strategy battle game can be found within the pages of the armies of the Lord of the Rings and the armies of the Hobbit, which is coming out not long after. And that answers another question. What's going to happen with the Hobbit profiles? How long are we going to have to wait for that to be brought in line with a new edition? Not long, by the sounds of it. You've got her historical allies. So, for example, Rohan and Minas Tirith together at Pelennor Fields. Um, when you are historical, you keep all of your army bonuses. Oh, which is really cool. Convenient allies, which is the yellow side, you lose your army bonus, but there are no negative effects. And impossible allies, impossible allies lose their army bonus. And additionally, all models may only benefit from heroic actions or standfast special that were called by a hero from the same army list. Uh, and I think that that is really cool. Again, it's building into the rule set things which can encourage you to go and play this game in a really thematic, cinematic way. And that can only be a good thing. Um, it also says here, if your army is made up of several allied conditions, bow limit is not calculated across the entire force, but separately across each allied contingent, which is as before. Uh, more than two allies, there are occasions where you may wish to include mobs from more than two are different army lists. In these situations, the lowest level of alliance from the alliance matrix is used for all alliances. So let's say you have two green and a, and, uh, a yellow, then you use the yellow. Um, so I really like that. If your army is several allied contingents, your leader must still be the hero from the highest heroic tier. All very, very cool stuff. Um, what else have we got in here? So I think after that, that is pretty much it. Now there were rumours that was it going to was it going to be that uh, that good and evil would be imposed upon us. Uh, although it does say in the basic principles of the game that you know it's designed to be played good and evil. Um, you do have a little section here at the back which says good versus good and evil versus evil. So doing tournaments where it's not good and evil are still possible. Although I imagine that we might see quite a few more um, good versus evil tournaments going forward. Um, of course you've got all the scenarios in the back. Um, I think that there are a couple of changes um, to the ones from the General's Accessories Pack. Um, Ill Met by Moonlight I think has definitely changed um, because it is now called A Clash by Moonlight. Uh, whereas all of the other ones have got the uh, the same names. Uh, so if you missed out on those, you can actually pick up the scenarios in the rule book. Um, so it comes down to my conclusions. Um, we're over an hour and a half into this now. Uh, this video which I'm hoping to get up early hours of Saturday morning so you guys can all see it as it goes up for pre-order and hopefully get clicking. Remember, if you want to help this channel and you want to help me and my endeavours, whether that be Articon, Hotgates Gaming going forwards, uh, or whatever it may be, uh, you will get, a, I believe it's a 20% discount if you order through Element Games and if you use the link below, that helps me. Um, you know, it help, helps me uh, gain store credit and the like. And if you use the code, you get double store credit. Um, so check out that link in the video description below. So what do I think of the box set? I'm a big fan of the box set. You know, uh, a lot of people say, oh, it's lazy to use models which are uh, from years and years and years ago. Moranans are still great plastics. The Witch King on Fell Beast is still a great plastic. Rides of Rohan have stood the test of time. They're still great plastics. That troll, it's a great plastic. I believe that you get some fantastic models. And sure, it might be shifting stuff from their warehouse and the like, but really, were we expecting to get uh, fully new detailed plastic miniatures? I don't think I was ever expecting that, to be honest. Not, not until there are not until every single profile in the game has a model that's, that, that you can use for it and at the moment that's not the case so I think that that's not a terrible thing and you get great value you know you, you save so much money by buying this box over buying all of its individual parts uh, constituent parts individually uh, and again that's got to be a really 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 good thing um, on top of that you get a big hardback rule book you get tokens you get you get obviously your dice your tape measures you get a scenario book and the like I, just, I think that this box is great value and if you're getting 20 percent off that with a local gaming store discount or using the link in the video description below you know it, that's a significant saving that's a significant that's like 20 odd quid saving uh, 20 quid saving uh, just more uh, just less than so that gives you um a bit, a bit of an idea of the value of the box. Uh, the fact that you get a big hardback rule book in it, which you're going to be able to buy individually for, you know, uh, I guess that 
and the army book isn't much less I suppose than this and you're getting all the miniatures going to be a good thing but I, I do think that as a start set because it's such an iconic uh, an iconic part of a lot of people's I guess childhoods or certain parts of their lives I think that it will attract players especially now that it is going into those local game stores so I think that that's a smart move in terms of the rule set itself uh, what do I think about that I think that uh, it's the same game I think it's the same game I, I don't think that people are going to play it and it feel inherently different I just think it's because it's going to have enough subtle differences um, that It'll be exciting for people who maybe been playing the game for a while and have been kind of waiting for some changes. Uh, you know, particularly I think the big the changes to magic are, are huge, and I think active and passive special rules, heroic tears is such a massive, massive part of it. Um, but more importantly, in some ways, as well as there being sort of a refreshing new elements of the game, um, you know, sorting out things like special strikes and the like, and, and making all that neater, and finding ways that those of you that have converted models before, you know, you'll still be able to use them, but you pay extra points. Uh, more importantly in some ways is the fact that these rules have been tightened up so much you know if you read the wording of them uh, on the whole it seems to have have really kind of made made a big effort to be a rule set which isn't going to come under too much scrutiny now I, that is going to happen and, and we're going to see that happen a lot as people play more and more and more games people are going to find synergies and they're going to go well hang on but it has been extensively play tested um you know so I trust the people that are involved with that. I know that a lot of members of the community were involved in that, uh, and I'm going to be really. I am actually really excited to 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 start playing the game. I'm looking forward. I'm going to be travelling up to Stirling, hopefully in November, and I really hope that um, if I am able to go to that, that that's going to give me my first kind of real, real, real taste of of you know using all these new heroics and using these new hero abilities um i think what actually excites me more than than this than the rule set itself which you know is great i'm very happy happy with it um i think what excites me more is the the army's books because of course that's where a great deal of what we know to to what is going to change is going to change it's going to be the profiles you know so who is going to have what type of weapon and what type of special rules and are the stat lines going to change and who's going to be merged and what army lists are they going to be in and what kind of army bonus are they going to be i think it's going to be a great deal more uh, more excitement than this this is the same game uh, you're not going to be playing a different game when you're playing Middle Earth Strategy Battle Gaming. I think this is a good point to wrap up the video and say thank you for staying here with me, getting plenty of painting done uh, for all of this time. Uh, I think that it's a, a natural point to kind of wrap up and also use this opportunity to say well done everybody because you know, well, well done to the guys who have been involved in, uh, in creating this edition of the game. It's no, uh, you know, no easy feat to keep everybody happy. Nor should you ever, ever try. You know, you won't, you won't keep all the people happy all the time, uh, which is a hard lesson I've le I learned a long time ago. Um, but I think that there has been a real conscious effort and care from people who truly love the game to make an edition of the game which is solid, which is fun, which is fixed a lot of the issues, not just issues in terms of how the game is played, but issues in the wording of certain things as well. You know, there's been a lot of considerations there and care. Uh, and that is appreciated. Uh, but all of that would have never, ever, ever have happened without you guys out there, the strategy battle gamers, the supporters of the Hobbit hobby, uh, who have supported this game, you know, for so, so, so many years, and through that huge surge of support, breathed life into into Project Middle Earth, which has led to those job roles and everything that's happened since, and the new miniatures, and ultimately the thing that so many of us have been looking forward to or hoped might be a possibility at some time in the future which is a merged rule set not Lord of the Rings strategy battle game Hobbit strategy battle game but Middle Earth strategy battle game and I can't be I couldn't be any more excited to uh, to lead my Rohirrim into battle going forwards guys I do hope you've enjoyed this video and, uh, and do expect more videos. It's good to be back. Hopefully you'll see more content from me again going forwards now that I have fixed my editing software. And if there's specific types of content you would like to see regarding the new game, let me know in the comments below. Big wave to all of my fellow friends who are doing the YouTube. Do go and check out all of those videos. You're going to get a, a, an absolute mummock ton of painting done over the next few weeks, I'm sure. So I hope you guys out there are having a good game because I'm certainly going to be having a good game in Middle Earth going forwards. Ciao.